talk about, I mean, relates to campaigning work around the, the public uh, university. Uh, so I don't really come at these issues from a research background, but probably in the light of what uh, Nick said from a wish to say no and see how many other people could get to say no as well. Also, I think, uh, you know, there's a, quite a bit of overlap with some of the things that others have, have spoken about. I um, think I disagree with Michael's view about, which is, I think, uh, suggesting that there was much greater continuity uh, between, um, you know, the past, if you like, the Keynesian uh, uh, form in relation to neoliberalism. I think there's something very distinctive about our current phase of neoliberalism, and particularly in the context of higher education. Because I think, whether he wished to or not, Robbins in 1963 did articulate a social democratic view of higher education and paradoxically did inaugurate a single system of public higher education. That's distinctive in the UK because it occurred in the context of the absence of a single system of public secondary education. And if people are interested in the debates about uh, the Finnish uh, education uh, system, particularly their sec secondary education system, its comprehensive character, its interest in equity. You could say that that was a system which uh, might have been brought into being in the 1960s through comprehensivization, and, but uh, didn't because of the failure to attack private schools. But paradoxically, a single system of public higher education was brought in, and that system is now being thoroughly dismantled and what is happening is that uh, public secondary education, the mixed economy of secondary education is also being transformed and higher education is being aligned with that transformation and re-establishment of status hierarchy within secondary education. And I'd suggest that part of what the ambition that underlied the push towards public higher education and mass higher education is the ambition of a knowledge society, and I'm going to suggest that that's different from a knowledge economy, and that what we're getting is a shift from a knowledge society to a global knowledge economy. And the difference is that just as there was an inclusive public interest in the idea of public higher education, so too there was an expression, if not realised, of an inclusive public interest in the knowledge society. That is, knowledge was going to function in terms of the general adaptive upgrading of jobs. Now what we have is a neoliberal knowledge economy explicitly associated with widening inequalities that begin from 1980 onwards. So there's a secular decline in inequality associated with reformist ideas that uh, public higher education uh, is associated with and then that gives way in the 1980s to widening inequalities, the polarisation of jobs, the division between good jobs and bad jobs, and then the attempt to re-articulate education in terms of that uh, divide. So that's uh, you know, what I'm essentially setting out. And So in talking about a neoliberal uh, knowledge regime, I want to characterise it in a few respects. I'll say something about teaching, because most of the things that been involved about have been to do with uh, uh, the impact of neoliberalism in terms of the new reg fee regime and its implications. But I think there's also a research regime there, and I wish to say much more about that. So it's quite straightforward in the Brown Review and the White Paper. And these are the only documents on higher education in, in the UK in which there are n there's no reference to wider values of higher education, the wider purposes that higher education might serve. Simply, it's considered as an investment in human capital and a private responsibility of individuals. An explicit denial of an inclusive public interest in education, except an implication that there might be an inclusive public interest in economic growth, except that what the Brown Review and the White Paper don't look at is how that economic growth no longer delivers for a very significant proportion of the uh, population. So what we're having is non-inclusive economic growth and the justification of higher education to produce 
an economic growth that doesn't benefit all. So, of course, Robbins was also interested in the economic functions of higher education. That's been a feature continuously, but, was, but the emphasis on education was much more inclusive in the past. It seems clear to me that what is designed is that, that the cap on fees at £9,000 is temporary and is designed to rise. And it's quite straightforward that um, Russell Group uh, vice chancellors are lobbying for that. And it's part of, the, you know, it was in the Brown Review that there should be no cap. And it's also the logic of the language of an international uh, uh, global higher education uh, regime, that there should be no difference between home and overseas students, because if it's international, what's one's own students, home students, are in effect international uh, students too. And, of course, that's a feature of American, uh, uh, you know, private but not-for-profit profit, uh, universities, the Ivy League and so on. But it's also designed that fees should fall for mass uh, higher education, that is produced by those outside the Russell Group and perhaps a few other institutions. That's because it's quite explicit that there should be an entry for for-profit providers, and that's including and especially multinational corporations, and that is in fact why the direct funding of teaching was removed in order to so-called level the playing field to enable for-profit uh, institutions to enter. And, of course, STEM subjects, although they suffered equivalent, uh, uh, you know, students have to pay the same increase in fees. Nonetheless, the continued public uh, funding going to STEM subjects means that they're protected from... Uh, uh, competition by for-profit companies who have no real interest in science education. And of course, it, I think it's also no accident that open access uh, to academic publishing is also promoted because one of the you know, costs for uh, for-profit uh, providers is the cost of library and providing curriculum materials. And now open access under CCBY allows the commercial reuse of uh, unrestricted reuse of the material of the social sciences and humanities for curriculum purposes by, by for-profit providers seeking to compete uh, with us. And at the same time, the argument is strongly to free universities to pursue for-profit activities and to seek for-profit partners. This is a different kind of for-profit than, say, Oxford University having Oxford University Press. Oxford University Press does not deliver for shareholders. It delivers revenues which go back into the purposes of the university, which is itself not for profit. The new partnerships are being, that are being set up derive profit from the activities of universities, even where those ac universities are themselves not, for, set, not set up as for profit, in order to present those... Uh, make those profits available to uh, shareholders and so on. And this is linked strongly to what, uh, to um, the activities and the lobbying of Pearson and Michael Barber, who, you know, if you trace his career, you see his career through, Ki through Kinsey, but, uh, McKinsey Consultancy. He, it's on the Brown Review, but he was also advising uh, the Labour government about the process of unbundling schools, and so that argument about unbundling the university now becomes part of the Michael Obama argument. It goes straight from the Brown Review to be the head of uh, Pearson uh, Higher Education. And what unbundling means is the outsourcing of the functions of uh, a university that can be teach that support uh, functions and to place those within the market. And the justification for doing that is value for money for students who are themselves being charged more. And therefore, you know, the aspect is, well, despite the higher fees that they're going to pay, shouldn't they get cheaper services from everything other than the uh, costs of their, their own degree? And Universities UK has a modernisation and efficiency agenda, and it quite explicitly sets that out in terms of privatising uh, support functions, and so the occupations at Warwick and at Sussex 
are clearly about that uh, aspect of the university. And phase two, the reports to University UK suggests that the modernization of efficiency agenda will be carried into the teaching uh, uh, functions of the university as well as its support functions and administrative functions. So, as I say, you ain't seen nothing yet. And so that's part of, of, of the language where what remains is a bundled university, elite universities, and the rest, uh, in a sense, dismantled, disaggregated, and so on. And one could say that in terms of this process of outsourcing, the university as a knowledge corporation internally becomes a microcosm of the inequalities found externally. So it's not simply that universities actually function in relation to a knowledge economy that doesn't itself function to uh, improve you know, standards of living generally within the public, but it also functions in terms of driving down the uh, working conditions and wages of members of the university community itself, who are, if you like, conveniently outsourced from that membership. And again, very key aspect of the Robbins report is the idea of the university as a community. And what we clearly see is we should no longer think of the university in that way. That's not consistent either with the idea of students as uh, uh, consumers. So what is the issue around scientific uh, research? I'm going to say, well, the impact of neoliberalism as a knowledge regime are different from for the natural sciences and for the social sciences and also for the humanities. But I'm going to suggest that the social sciences are in a peculiar position, and their peculiar position is one of the reasons why they were so crap at responding to the Brown Review and everything. So you had Save Science campaign, you had Save the Humanities campaign, you didn't have an equivalent campaigns within the social sciences. And I'll say that's something about how they're positioned in relation to these changes. And in thinking about, you know, arguing the campaign for the public university might have been a campaign for the social sciences, except for the need to think of something more broadly across universities. But I think there is something peculiar about the positioning of social science. So the impact agenda is what impinges directly upon scientific research. It's primarily focused on the product cycle and in a very nice catchphrase, shortening the time from idea to income. It's clearly seen in terms of the introduction of patents and intellectual uh, property. That goes back in the US to the Bay Dole Act of 1980. Open access, big data under CCBY license is designed to speed up commercialization. But that process, given that there is not simply uh, the scientific paper is not itself the substance of the contribution. There is an underlying practice or substance to the research which is patentable independently of holding copyright in the paper. And so CCBY simply encourages the process of taking uh, knowledge into uh, 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 ownership and, and, and privatization of the commons in that way. And one sees an interesting track which uh, if you like, opens up after, you know, particularly around Rothschild's, Lord Rothschild's involvement in science policy in the 70s and 1980s, an idea that there shouldn't be a public uh, subsidy if there's a private beneficiary. This is articulated by Rothschild in terms of the customer or beneficiary of research should pay. That what we now have is the idea that there should be no public funding unless there is a private beneficiary. That's the impact I uh, gender. The commercialization of the commodification of the research, publicly funded with no issue about the private appropriation of that uh, research and the nature of, the, of any return going to the public who have funded it. Right? Might go to the individual scientist who's patented his or her ideas, but it doesn't go further than that. And quite interesting work is being set out in uh, Philip Mirosky in Science Mart, um, but also Mariana Matsukato in a recent book just come out, The Entrepreneurial State, that says what we now have is public funding accepting the risk of fundamental research, but private interests accruing the rewards. 
and at the same time a distortion of the research process because the urge to shorten the time uh, uh, from idea to income is putting pressure upon basic research and indeed uh, Mirovsky and Mazzucato both put out arguments of why the of, uh, private venture capitalism increased IP has led to less innovation rather than more because they locate innovation through the public funding of research which is being pressured. So there are serious issues for science research but they're not the same as social science uh, research. And so in order to think about what, or what is the problem of social science research is I think there's a sense in which social science is a direct competitor for neoliberalism in terms of claims about knowledge. That is, neoliberalism is a theory of knowledge, and it's a theory of knowledge in competition with other, or potentially in competition with other social scientific accounts, and that's what opens up a divide. So one could say that what neoliberalism does, and can go quite quickly through this because you know, it was very well set out uh, earlier today, it organizes an idea that there's a problem of monopoly. This is understood to be the collective appropriation of power, positions the state as a form of monopoly, so sets up a state market opposition. Monopoly then doesn't arise as a consequence of market failure, but as a failure to establish markets, and therefore the uh, response to monopoly is not regulation, it's to deregulate. The market is seen as a means of aggregating knowledge based upon individual points of view or individual, uh, 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 individuals' own perceptions of their situations and value and so on, deriving from their different... Uh, location and interest. The state cannot, or the collective planner cannot second guess effectively what the aggregation of many individuals could do. And in that context, social organization itself, especially where collectively constituted, is also seen as a distortion of markets and therefore something that, you know, uh, cast in this uh, illegitimate terms. And what one could say is social organization or the social is a problem from the point of view of uh, neoliberalism. And what they have is a critique of society and neoliberalism constitutes itself as a basis of rational public policy designed to produce market-aligned behaviors against social uh, obstacles to them. And that means, well, what is the purpose of social science. So for a long time, and particularly within sociology, sociology was thought of as producing knowledge or expertise that served policy makers and so on. That was a classic uh, association with the welfare state. But the state is no longer interested, or the state under neoliberalism is no, not interested in expert knowledge in relation to social problems, only expert uh, knowledge is to serve the subsumption of everything under markets. One of the reasons why Hayek didn't set up or think of economics as an empirical si science. Subsumption to the market, of course, requires a, a strong state and does provide a role for social scientific knowledge of a particular kind. And so now, what kind do we get? It's clear that what uh, social sciences don't produce is commercial knowledge in the sense of the product cycle, which is at the focus of natural science policy. Although there's one exception, and it's one that uh, Claire referred today, and that is the commercialization of techniques of analysis, that is, forms of performance and performativity indicators, and that's what the big data open access is about. So if people think, well, how are national health, health hospitals evaluated? They're evaluated by Dr. Foster. What is Dr. Foster? Dr. Foster is a private company set up by academics, funded by government, in order to produce indicators to undermine the National Health Service. And these indicators are proprietary indicators, so there is, in a sense, a commercial capture of critical evaluation of public functions. And what you're getting is, I think, what neoliberalism is, is a reduction of public functions to the market, including the public function of uh, critique. 
inequalities, so uh, what is designed to do is provide technologies of behavioral change. And the ESRC has recently set up an investment or been forced by the government. It's kind of interesting because nobody has criticized the insistence by the government that the ESRC should fund what works centers. And nobody has commented that the what works centers involve entities, the recent one, the police college, which is not constitutionally established in a way that allows it to receive ESRC funding. The legislation to make the police college a body that can accept funding from the ESRC will take place next year if legislative time allows. In the meantime, the ESRC is funding academics to work with uh, the police college, with the police college, the owner of the research produced by the academics. The ESRC, as with other research councils, has insisted that on uh, open access under CCBY. What works is under commercial IP. So the products of this research will be available to commercialization. Why should they be available to commercialization? Because the police college, when it's newly constituted, will be selling services to police forces about uh, uh, what works. So one, uh, now, I haven't had a single response from anybody that I've written to saying, isn't this a breach of ESRC? Shouldn't we be doing something about it? Not put your head down over this one, John. Just no response to the email. No response to the, perhaps you didn't get my email. <laughs> no response to that. Now that says something about the capacity of academics. Not simply to say, I wasn't even saying no, but should we raise a question about why this isn't under CCBY, given that it's mandated for ESRC funding? So... What I think what we're getting is a re-engineering of social sciences towards a form of behavioural science that assumes social structural determinants of behaviour except as external contextual features. It's significant that the one thing, one of the things that reduces crime is changes in social structure, including the distribution of inequalities. That is not an available reduction. Right? So it's what reduces crime given the state of inequality. So I think what we have now in the social sciences is a rise of what I call antisocial sciences. That is, sciences that share the opposition to the social and are actually engaged with a sort of arcane form of behavioral science. So I'll say one last uh, thing, because where I agree with um, uh, Nick, you know, is around issues of voice. And I think what is going on is an attack upon voice. But I don't see it directly in terms of my preferences to think of, well, there's an opposition between state and market. And that dichotomy of state and market is incredibly functional from the point of view of neoliberal ideologies and arguments. So what I prefer to think of what the alternative to both state and market is the idea of the public, which I take from uh, John Dewey, particularly because what Dewey did was argue that the state you know, that one shouldn't theorise politics on the basis of the state, but on the basis of the public. A public depends on dialogue. That's a key issue of uh, voice, with politics in some sense as the representation of publics. The reduction of politics, of public functions, to the market is the reduction to something which is non-dialogical. That's the character of the market. It's outside uh, dialogue, and therefore, in that sense, it's anti-democratic. So in thinking of the coll collective spaces where we might uh, authentically gather that voice, you know, true rather than false spaces, I can't remember the language that Nick used, we might say, well, the paradox is the public university is that space, a space for the production and dissemination of knowledge, including the evaluation of expertise. What we're getting is the reduction of the space of the public university. So the privatization of the public university is anti-democratic, but it also reconfigures the social sciences to establish the hegemony of commercially oriented anti-social 
sciences. And so in thinking of that, in defending the university, in defending the public university, we can't separate that from issues of democracy. And I think we're called to respond not simply as social scientists, but also as citizens on behalf of an inclusive public interest.